Well, welcome back this evening. And if you weren't here this morning, welcome. If we have any visitors this evening, you are our honored guest, and we do appreciate you coming out and being with us. I honestly, if if you're, if, oh, I do see one visitor. <laughs> he got, I got a little head nod. Anyway, uh, just kind of recapping a little bit uh, on this morning. Um, the uh, almost everything I I'm going to tell you is pretty much in here, so. You know, just kind of look back through it. Um, get the uh, baptism, uh, Christian Rube, and if you would like to, there's there's postcards in the uh, foyer. Also, uh, fellowship dinners next Sunday, and that is potluck. And so, uh, bring something good. I I'm, I've been losing some weight, and I may have to put it back on a little. It gives me an opportunity, and I love eggs, by the way. I'm just uh, the deviled eggs are great. Uh, memorials, uh, please check the list for me. I, I'd appreciate that. I have not got anybody say anything to me about it, so maybe I did okay. Um, Sign-up sheets. There are several. I know that there's. Uh, uh, for communion preparations and, and cookies for the jail. And my wife would really appreciate it if you would sign up for help in the girls' camp. And, uh, and that, that pays you back uh, in dividends. I know I've, 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 not the girls' camp, but I've done the camps. So it's, it's very rewarding. And then, uh, you got the sweetheart dinner coming up just around the corner. And uh, my wife has finagled me and herself into doing some things there. So if you want to see us make a fool of ourselves, come on out. Uh, ladies day out and then the ladies, uh, ladies retreat. Also like to mention uh, March 3rd, is the area-wide youth night on the 27th is men's breakfast i guess that oh yeah it says here at the church building and uh it just goes right after that march 9th again it's a sweetheart dinner so that's the in the jail ministry let's see did i do did i do okay kathy got it in there okay is there any other announcements that need to be made at this time? Okay, let's enter into our worship service with a word of prayer. Our most gracious God and Father, as we come here together to worship you and to uh, give you honor and glory for our lives and, and, uh, and being uh, the Savior of ourselves that... Uh, we certainly look to you as, as our Savior and, and, uh, and Christ, the sacrifice he made. Father, we, we are totally within your hands, and uh, we know, Father, that many of us are struggling with trials, tribulations, temptations, all those things that you have promised us that... Um, that will just make us stronger. And we pray, Father, that as we go through life, that we will always hang on that and understand that that uh, we may be able to, able to help others through the trials that we're going through now. Father, we we love you, and and uh, as we uh, lift up our voices this evening and, and lift up. You through our lesson this evening, we pray that that we'd wholeheartedly be uh, focused, focused on that service. Father, we we pray that you'd be with our number that are sick and ill, 
and pray, Father, that uh, if there's any that are indifferent uh, and or have fallen away, that, that you'd make us aware of that, that we might be able to help those and show them our love. And in Christ's name we pray, amen. Good evening. Our first song this evening will be 567. 567. We'll sing all three verses. 567. <clears throat> Restore my spirit, Lord, I need.
But before. Uh, Rick Flesh will sing 523. 523. We'll sing all the. <clears throat> I know the Lord will find a way. Good job, Wyatt, leading singing. As you notice, we're not doing youth tonight. That's because the Howertons are coming from a youth event over in uh, Tennessee. And they called today, and they're on the, they were getting close to Nashville, and said they'll be back tonight sometime. I guess Kyle has to go to work tomorrow. So it was a great time. There was over 12,000 folks gathered over there. And, and I remember when you get that many people together singing, I asked him, did you all sing? And he said, yeah, and it was fantastic. So if you've ever been a part of that kind of group singing, it, it truly is wonderful. One of the things that, as we think about the church, whether it be in mission fields or in Marshville, Missouri, in Tennessee, with a bunch of young people or at a college lectureship, you cannot escape what is always and should be on our mind, and that's attracting people to Christ. Because our mission is to reveal Christ to the world, to take the gospel to the world. And with that in mind, I want you to take your Bibles, if you would, and turn to Zechariah chapter 8. We're going to use that as a basis for our study somewhat tonight. And I want to say again, as echoing what Haley mentioned, thank you for all the work that's been done here around the building. There's a lot been going on. There was a lot done while we were away in January. And to come back and to see the work being done, it's, it's, and what's been accomplished is wonderful. Also, I want to say that I think there was two baptisms, correct, Randy, at the jail, one lady and uh, an Hispanic gentleman, right, Nacho? Did he only speak Spanish? Is he the one that only spoke Spanish? So that shows you how effective it is for somebody like Nacho to be around, and that's wonderful. And I'm sure that gave that man a sense of comfort, but not only that, he enabled him to learn where he would not have been able to do so. So please remember those that are baptized at the jail and those that are being worked with and their future because they have opportunities to be attracting people to Christ, which is very, very important. In Zechariah chapter 8, I want to start actually with verse 1. We read the words again, the word of the Lord of hosts came saying thus says the lord of hosts i am zealous for zion with great zeal with great fervor i am zealous for her so the focus is upon zion or as we would sometimes say jerusalem as you go to isaiah isaiah 1 1 and 2 and other passages you'll read about zion is commonly used in the prophets 
And then as you go into verse 3, Thus says the Lord, I will return to Zion, dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. Jerusalem shall be called the city of truth. What a wonderful thing to read. The mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain. Then look at verse 4. The Lord says, thus, or thus says the Lord of hosts, Old men and old women shall again sit in the streets of Jerusalem. Each one with his staff in his hand because of his great age, the streets of the city shall be full of boys and girls playing in its streets. Now, if you recognize that when you read in the prophets of Zion, the mountain of Jerusalem, that many times that prophecy is twofold and primarily in reference to what is to come underneath Christ, the Messiah. And so as you look at the prophet uh, and his words, you can see how those words echo under inspiration. For example, talking about the holy mountain, oftentimes when people read that, they might think of just the temple. But, of course, that was all but a shadow of the truth. And we have the privilege of enjoying the truth. And as you think about this, this picture given to us by the prophet of, of the streets being full of boys and girls playing in the streets. What a beautiful picture of the church. A church that is a congregation made up of those of age as well as those that are young. And that's what we desire to see in the church, this building full of young people as well as older folks. We don't want to leave anybody out, of course, in between. So if you're, st you're in that area, that is wonderful. And as we go on and consider the subject, I want you to think about an attraction that occurred in John chapter 4. Most of us know the story of the woman that Jesus encountered at the well, the Samaritan woman. And when the disciples came up and saw Jesus talking to this woman, they marveled that he talked with her. But then we read in the verse 27, yet no one said, why or what do you seek or why are you talking with her? What do you seek? Why are you talking with her? They didn't verbalize that, but obviously those were thoughts that were important. Well, the woman then left her water pot, went her way into the city and said to the men, now here's what I want you to notice. She goes and leaves Christ, and Jesus has had a discussion with her about her husbands, also pointing out that, that he could give her the water that would allow her to never thirst. And so... She goes in the city and she says, Come see a man who told me all things that I ever did. And then she poses this question, Could this be the Christ? And with those words, look at verse 30. Then they went out of the city and came to him. So what did she do? Well, with her words, she was able to say the things that would attract those men to come to see who? Jesus. And when we think about what does it take to attract people to Christ, sometimes the answer comes up with things like this. Sometimes there'll be a, a full stage full of rock musicians and so forth, and there'll be a screen in the back, a huge screen with words that follow uh, referencing the songs that they're singing, and they use this that, uh, in such a way as to attract people. Oh, come here and, and see Jesus, and we're going to play you music like this. Well, is that really the attraction that Jesus had in mind when he spoke to the woman of the well? Is that the, the attraction that Jesus had in mind when he told the disciples to go all into all the world and preach the gospel? Of course not. Nor was it this one. This is an article about, a news story about an Ohio quote-unquote pastor who rides bulls inside his church to attract new believers. Now, aren't you glad that we don't read that? I'm going to tell you something. I'm not getting on one. <laughs> My encounters with bulls have never been pleasant at all, and it wasn't about riding one. Even the one that pitched me in the air with his head, that was bad enough. That was close I want to get to riding a bull. But can you imagine? Attracting people to the church? Does Jesus need this kind of attraction? Well, I think most of us could answer that. 
And this is another one. It's a video. You can watch it on YouTube. And I, I, if I had that on the screen, I could probably play it to you, but you can get the gist of the idea. They were giving away millions of dollars worth of merchandise, and that included cars. And as they began to advertise, what was an amazing thing is that people donated cars from dealerships to, to add to their giveaway. And so people flocked in there for this free giveaway. Now, once again, did they come to see Jesus? Was this attracting people to Jesus, or were they after the loaves and the fishes? Well, I think we know the answer. But in Zechariah, he goes on, and if you want to jump down to verse 23, we read the words, Thus says the Lord of hosts, In those days ten men from every language of the nations shall grasp the sleeve of a Jewish man, saying, Let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. Is it going to be riding a bull, giving away automobiles, or, or having a rock band perform? Is that going to be what attracts people to Jesus? Or is it going to be more of what we read here? Let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. How did the disciples prove that their words were the words from God? Well, they backed it up with the miracles that were performed. Word spread. News spread. But it wasn't just the miracles that was important. It was the fact that they were doing that which God gave them as a mission. And that was to follow that with the preaching. In Micah chapter 5, verse 2, we read of Bethlehem in this prophecy. Though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel. What we want to think about is when we think about attracting people to Christ, we're attracting people to the king, the ruler. And notice he says, from whose goings forth are from old, from everlasting. In attracting people to Christ, we must reveal to them something very important. That is that Jesus is more than just a man. Look at verse 3 of Micah 5. Therefore he shall give them up until the time that she is, who is in labor has given birth. Then the remnant of his brethren shall return to the children of Israel. Why is there a return of remnant? Who are they? They're the people that are united with God. And with God, there is proof that it's necessary for men to reach out to the Messiah. As you know, much of the Old Testament was written in reference to the coming of the Messiah. What is amazing is that that Messiah was not just anyone, was he? He was the eternal God. God who came in the flesh. That's John 1, including verse 14. But here's what's amazing. There are found, according to those who have done some research, over 480, or 56, excuse me, Old Testament verses referring to the Messiah or his times. Now, conservatively, scholars believe that there's at least 300 prophecies with reference to Christ. And there's a list. I've got a list if you ever would like to get a copy of it. And I think it has 350, if I remember right. Charlotte, is that correct, 350? Because I think you all put me onto this list. But it's amazing. The amount of prophecies and things that are said in the Old Testament as proof that Christ is the Messiah. And why should the world know that? Well, it gives us the proof that it's necessary to prove that Jesus, that we follow and that we preach, is the Messiah. I don't know if you're someone who spends much time looking at the videos on uh, the websites for Apologetic Press. You can download the app on your phone. I know many of you have that. There are a lot of good evidences that prove that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah. And one that caught my attention was the question with reference to Jesus Christ being a fairy tale character or a historical figure. Because a lot of people have concluded that it's a fairy tale. But to conclude that, they neglect the 
history that is given to us through the ages with reference to Christ, even outside of the Scripture. So don't look at the stories like Jesus healing multitudes or calming the sea or walking on the water and say, oh, that's just a fictitious fairy tale character. And unfortunately, people buy into it. Kyle Butt wrote these words, Most children and adults easily recognize the name Jesus Christ. Many even call, can tell the story of his life. However, these same people also recognize the names Peter Pan, Snow White, and Cinderella. And they can relate the facts of these fairy tales as well. Is Jesus of Nazareth a fictional character that deserves to be included in a list of mystifying magicians, daring dragon slayers, and flying boy heroes? Or should his name take its well-deserved position in the halls of factual history? And that's a question that we need to be sure we can answer. Because it's a question that the world needs answered. Well, there's a lot of things in history that are often ignored. And the reality that in history we have records of a man called Jesus. Josephus, all the way down to... the the uh, thousand years of time from the first century record information that's passed down through history. Haley was talking about a video that Kathy and I were watching the other day with reference to letters written uh, by Caiaphas to Rome and the information contained about Jesus the Christ. And Tacitus, in AD 56, wrote his, his period of time. When he wrote, he wrote as an opponent of Jesus and recorded the information that gives us proof that Jesus was a, a historical figure, not just a myth, not just a fairy tale. And this is important because we want people to come to Jesus. We want them to recognize that he was more than just a mythical figure, a fairy tale. We want them to know that he is the Son of God. He is the promised Messiah. And therefore, we want to be the people that follow him. And in order for us to be those people, look at what we read in Zechariah 8, verse 3. Jerusalem shall be called the city of truth, the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain. Where's the world going to go to find the truth? Well, we know it's right here. And we need to be people, of course, that uphold that truth. And when you gentlemen and ladies go to the jail, what are you doing there? You're doing exactly that. You're upholding the truth. Whenever we talk to a friend or neighbor and we can get them to sit down and open up their Bibles, what are we doing? We're upholding the truth. We're revealing to them what is essential that they know. And included in that must be that Christ is at the center. He is the one that was prophesied. He is the Messiah. He is the one that went to the cross. He reigns supreme as king. And that is a part and an element of truth that they need to know that's included in this book. They need that truth because nothing can change their hearts and their minds in the right direction, but simply the truth. And it's interesting that Paul wrote to Timothy, he says, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourselves in the house of God, which is the church of the living God. And look at what we have as that description of that church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of the truth. And as Jesus said, what's important about the truth? It is that which has the power to change lives, to sanctify, make one pure. And where does it come from? From the Word. And Jesus came preaching the truth. This is the world we live in, folks. This is why the lesson tonight. The answer is in the Scripture, but we live in a world that's disoriented, bewildered, perplexed, unclear, confused, unsure, and it's sadly to say lost. But I'm thankful we have the truth, aren't you? We do have something for the world. Back there in the track rack, there's a number of tracks that you can pick up and that you can take to somebody, your friends, your neighbors, people you work with, leave it anywhere, in a restaurant, it doesn't matter, that contains the truth. And it's the truth that will make their difference. And if we can get them to see that we can offer them the truth, what are they going to do? 
they're going to change their direction. They're not going to be continue to drive down that highway that leads them the wrong direction. They're going to take the exit. But you might be thinking, there are a whole lot of folks not here. And I don't mean just that should be, there are a number. I'm talking about the folks out there in the world. How many of you have neighbors you like to be like to see sitting next to you in the pew? Almost every one of us, right? How many of you have family you'd like to see sitting next to you in the pew? So how do we get them here? How do we let them know that we are biblically the family of God that's at the center of the prophecies? How do we let them know that we have the truth? Well, it is a challenge, isn't it? Because they see us just like all the other religious folks that are gathered around in any community. But we want them to know that we are a people that belong to the Christ and that we're those who do have access to the truth, and that we're set apart, we're sanctified because of the truth, and that we do have something to offer them. Well, how do we let them know? Well, I think that we need to take the opportunity that we have, any time we have, to let them know that we are a people that belong to the Christ. How's that going to happen? Well, one, it happens because we can verbalize it, but secondly, it can happen because we live the truth. And I thank God for all of you that do so. Look at Zechariah 8. They shall dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. They shall be my people, and I will be their God in truth and righteousness. Who's your God? That's important. And it doesn't hurt us to ask them, who is your God? Or who is the Messiah? Do you know about the Messiah? Because we need to deal with the question, how do we let them know that we are a family, a fellowship of God's children in the church that belongs to Christ? How do we let them know? I'm thankful that we have this verse. Because this gives us the answer. You know, it's not so much we have a sign out front, is it? How do we know? John 13, verse 34 and 35. Jesus said, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. That's why that loving one another is so wonderful and so powerful. But then in verse 35, Here's how powerful it really is. By this, all will know that you are my disciples. How? If you have love for one another. Folks, people see it. And I can compliment you on this. I have had people tell me that. They've seen you being loving. And you have had a momentous effect upon their lives. Well, why? Well, it's because what Jesus said that would happen if the world sees us loving each other in a spiritual way, in a, a way that God wants us to love with that God love, that sacrificial love, what is going to be the response? They're going to know that we are truly the followers of Christ, the Messiah. They're going to see Christ in our lives and how we live because we are a fellowship that is not just folks that gather in a building on Sunday. We are a fellowship of God's people, the church, that form that family. And folks are looking for that in their lives. They want folks that are family. As Paul wrote in Romans 12, verse 9, Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor that which is evil, but cling to that which is good. We are a people that cling to good. And then we are a people that's kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. And I know we're challenged with that at times. I love my wife dearly and she loves me and I know it, but sometimes I challenge her. But even in the challenge, we know what the end's going to be. Because in honor, we give preference. And that's the secret to the brotherly love that works, in honor, giving preference to one another. And then we turn around and expose that love by doing what Galatians 6, 2 tells us, to bear one another's burdens. Every week I hear something about something you are doing. It may not be so public, but someone will mention, so-and-so did this. 
So-and-so did this. Brother and sister did this. Folks, you're to be commended. I want to encourage you as we look into this new year to, to keep doing what you're doing and then grow that because that is our secret that we're looking at. How are we going to attract people to Christ? It's going to be by our actions. And that action includes that love and that giving preference and that bearing one another's burdens. In Zechariah 8, verse 12, we read the words, For the seed shall be prosperous. Who are we talking about? Well, of course, this is not a who. It's, a, it's the physical prosperity. But the seed will be prosperous, the vine shall give its fruit, the ground shall give her increase, the heavens shall give their due. I will cause the remnant of this people to possess all these. Who does prosperity truly belong to? It belongs to the people of God. That was true in the Old Testament, it's true today. Prosperity that really counts is that which God's people possess. And that is spiritual prosperity. How is your spiritual prosperity? Are you struggling with it? You don't have to be. Are you here tonight and not a Christian? You don't have to be. Tonight, the door is open. And we want you to consider this is why it comes up here and leads us in our song of invitation. If we can help you, please let us know by coming forward. May I see the hands of those who would like to be served the communion?
Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day that you've given us. Father, that we might gather here as your church. And Father, at this time for those who partake of this communion, we'd ask that they do so in a way pleasing in thy sight. And Father, help us to realize that this bread represents your son's body, your son's name. Amen. Father, again, as we remember your son's death, help us to understand that this fruit of vine represents your son's blood that was shed on our behalf. Father, we trust that people take of it in a way pleasing in thy sight. Your son's name, amen. May I bring a contribution plate to anyone? I don't see anyone. Uh, thank you for that lesson, uh, Brother Rick. Uh, <clears throat> if we need jugglers to get people in, I know a pretty good one. Yeah. No, I'm just kidding. All right, for our last song this evening, I'll ask you, go ahead and grab your book, uh, 484. We'll sing 484. Um, they have the slides for it, but we always get kind of conjumbled because how they sing it is kind of odd. I don't really, I, I was always kind of taught to sing in a different way. So how we're going to sing is we're going to sing both verses of part one, then we'll sing part two just one time through, and that'll, that'll be the conclusion of the song, okay? So 484. You're my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I seek. You are my all in all. Seeking you as a precious jewel. Lord, to give up I'd be a fool. You are my all in all. Taking my sin, my cross, my shame, rising again, I bless your name. You are my all in all. When I fall down, you pick me up. When I am dry, you fill my cup. You are my all in all. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name.
bow with me. Most gracious and dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, dear Lord, for this time you've given us this beautiful day, Father, that we could come together here to study another portion of your word, Father, and hear songs from you that only you're worthy of, Father, and we thank you for that, and the fact, Father, that we can come together here without fear of persecution and meet, Father, and we thank you for that. Thank you, Father, for many blessings you give us every day, Father, and we pray pray that this time, Father, you would be with all our number that could not be here today, Father, because of sickness and in health and because of other reasons, Father, we pray that you would be with them and help them to get better that they can come back at the next appointed time, Father, and pray that you would go with us as we go to our homes, Father, and see us back safely at the next appointed time. And this we pray in your Son's most holy name. Amen. <laughs>